Father, we ask you to be present with us today that your Holy Spirit would teach us. May we learn that you were present in the incarnation of your son Jesus, and you continue by your spirit to be present in the early church. We are the heirs to the great promise you made starting all the way back to Abraham and even before, really. And we thank you for that. Teach us what our heritage is. Teach us to understand more of our family and what you have been active in doing throughout the entire history of the church. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs> okay. Um, our outline. Last week we looked at introduction to church history, and I mostly dealt with the sort of geopolitical kinds of stuff. What, what were the great empires? What were the historical events that affected the Jews, especially, and created kind of the expectation? I'm going to touch on that just briefly today, again as a precursor to the topic for today, which is apostles to Catholic Christianity. Catholic does not mean Roman Catholic. Catholic means universal. And in that regard, what I'm referring to is that in the first century, that is by the death of what's called the apostolic age, the death of the last apostle, John, sometime between 95 and 100 AD, so the very end of the first century. Uh, by that time, the Christian faith had evolved from not just being a Jewish religion. It was seen as a Jewish sect at first. All of the first believers were Jewish. It had expanded beyond that so that it was universal. And that's what we mean by Catholic. So today we're going to talk about from the Apostles to the Catholic Christianity, the, the acceptance by not just uh, Jews, but others. Next week we'll talk about persecution, heresies in the book, then emperors, bishops, saints and intellectuals, councils, monks, popes, and Augustine, uh, schisms, barbarians, and Gregory the Great, Charlemagne, cathedrals, crusades, and scholastics, and then the last week we will do poverty, the Inquisition, and the Babylonian captivity, this is not the same as the Babylonian captivity the Jews experienced. Okay? This is a different Babylonian captivity with quotes around it. Um, and then the second hour of the last week, week eight, we will do the final exam. Okay? Um, one thing, let me say, uh, make sure you are looking at your reading list, which I don't have a copy of it with me right now. Next week, we meet at the same time. Week after that, this class still meets on Wednesday, but if you're part of the other two classes, they meet on different dates. Wait, what? Or, I'm sorry, this is Friday. Friday. What day is today? This <laughs> class will meet on Tuesday in two weeks. I'll remind you next week. But um, the Thursday and Friday classes, there's twice during these eight weeks that well, they get shifted. The Thursday class goes to Monday, the Friday class goes to Tuesday, because I have to be up now. Okay? All right, let's talk about... Um, the history of the early church, the first century, the apostolic age. We always have to recognize that Christianity did start from Jewish roots. Jesus was a Jew. Uh, Christianity began as an offshoot. Many people perceived it as a sect of Judaism. And it occurred, we talked about last week, the fullness of time, the perfect time for Christianity to uh, occur, first century Palestine, given all of the world events, the geographical location. And it was a time especially when the Jewish expectation was great that God would send a Messiah, the Christ, which means the anointed one, to bring freedom to the Jews and to establish the kingdom of God on earth. So it was a Jewish expectation that was to be fulfilled by the coming of Jesus. The promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and on down through the Jewish history was that God would uh, make them great, they would make th that they would be his chosen people, but in every major covenant agreement, God also said, and through you I will bless all the other peoples of the world. So by fulfilling God's promise to the Jewish people through the Messiah who was Jesus, he also fulfilled his promise to expand his grace to all other people. The Jews in the first century were looking for a Messiah which they thought would lift Israel back up, would make them great again, that it would be like the King David, that they would uh, make, drive off all the oppressors, defeat all of Israel's foes, and make them a nation of all nations in the world, because they were God's chosen people. That was the expectation. And it was under that expectation that Christianity, that Jesus came, and then Christianity was established and started to grow. Now, again, a few historical roots, just because these are all going to be relevant to the context for today. In 332 B.C., that is just over 300 years before Jesus, Alexander the Great 
had conquered the whole known world, and that was this was the year that, that he conquered Palestine, this part of the world that Israel was in. In 323, he died, and the empire gets split up between his generals. Um, 198, the Seleucids have control. Seleucus was one of the generals under uh, Alexander, and his descendants have gained control of Palestine. In 190, one of the heirs to the Seleucid Empire, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, starts to oppress the Jews, setting up a, temp a statue of Zeus in the temple, forcing them to eat pork and to sacrifice pigs, uh, killing people, including women and children, for, for circumcising their male children or for having a copy of the Hebrew Bible. A horrible persecution of the Jews, which leads to the Maccabean re Rebellion or Revolt. In 161, Jewish independence is gained from the Seleucids. They are driven off, and they start the Hasmonean dynasty. There's a period of about 100, uh, about 100 years there is the only period of real independence that the, the Jews had in about a 1,000-year history. Um, from the time of the Babylonian captivity in the 500s BC until the fall of the Roman Empire, the Jews were always under somebody else's control, except for about 100 years there, the Hasmonean dynasty, where it was Jewish kings that were ruling over them. Then in 63 BC, Pompey, the great Roman general, uh, conquers uh, all of Palestine and captures Jerusalem for Rome. In 37 BC, Rome appoints Herod the Great to be the king over this region. Herod was not Jewish, although he married a Jewish wife. Miriam, who was part of the Hasmonean dynasty. He actually was Idumean. He was a descendant of, uh, of Edom, of Esau, not of uh, the Jewish line. Okay? Um, then in four, uh, somewhere 4 to 6 BC, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Between 26 and 36 AD, Pontius Pilate is appointed governor. He's the fifth of the Roman governors to rule over Judea and Samaria, the largest part of Palestine. Um, one of Originally, one of uh, Herod the Great's sons, Archelaus, had been appointed there. He only served for 10 years. He was so horrible. There were so many complaints about him that the Romans finally uh, exiled him, and they put their own governors, who directly reported to Rome over this area. Pontius Pilate was the fifth of those. Around um, AD 30, Jesus is crucified, resurrected, and ascended. AD 30 is also when the day of Pentecost occurs. We're going to get into that. The church begins to grow, and the first persecution, which is a persecution by the Jews in Jerusalem, starts. Uh, AD 34, Stephen becomes the first Christian martyr, and the Christian diaspora begins. We'll talk about what diaspora means. And then in AD 34, Saul is converted on the road to Damascus and becomes Paul. Oh, I didn't even give you the rest of those. <laughs> Let me do all these again. <laughs> Sorry. I forgot that I'd broken this up as I'm talking about it. Um, so, again, all this is online. I apologize, by the way, this stuff wasn't up earlier, but I had not finished all of the slides in time for us to upload it, so it'll go up this afternoon. All right? Uh, any questions about that real quick high point of history? Virtually everything in there is going to be relevant to what we talk about today, and that's why I wanted to go over that again. Saying that the Christian church started as a Jewish sect, we also have to recognize that Jesus was Jewish. And, in fact, he was very Jewish. And recognizing that, we see that God had promised that the Jews, and in fact, as I said earlier, all the peoples of the earth would be blessed through his promise to Abraham, which was a promise for the creation of the Jewish people. Later on, God spoke through his prophets, especially Isaiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel, and said that he would send a Messiah, an anointed one, to come and save and be the leader of his people. And... For the many, many centuries that Israel was under somebody else's thumb, the more oppressed they were, the more they expected that there would be a Messiah. In Jesus' time, the Jews had been oppressed by foreign powers for most of the previous 500 years. And after Jesus, for most of the subsequent 500 years, they are as well. Even the independence that they gained under the Maccabeans, which is the Hasmonean dynasty. They're called the Maccabeans because the, the first great military leader of the family that, that started the revolt was Judas. His father was Matthias, a priest, and he was called Judas Maccabeus, which means Judas the Hammer, because he was very effective as a general. And so they became the Maccabeans, that family, and then the dynasty is called the Hasmonean dynasty. 
Um, so you'll see those words, Maccabean and, and Hasmonean. For all intents and purposes, they mean the same thing. It's just the Maccabees were the first family. The Hasmoneans were their descendants that ruled for about 100 years. Okay? Then the Jews, during this time of oppression, were looking for the promised Messiah to free them, and many believed that it also would lead to the end of the world and the coming of God's judgment. That when God set Israel up again, like he had under David, he'd go even further and he would create... The, the perfect world where the Jews would be the ruling people over all the earth. This was especially one of the beliefs of the Essenes. Remember, the Essenes were one of the four groups. The Essenes were the ascetic kind of, uh, they, they lived as hermits, lived off by themselves, segregated communities. They were the mystics. And they really believed that when the Messiah came, that the world as we know it would end. And we would go on to God's glorious kingdom. Those expectations are not unlike our expectations that in the final day God will establish heaven. Right? A new heaven and a new earth. That's a very ancient Jewish kind of idea. And the expectation for the fulfillment of God's promise in a new heaven and new earth is one of the fundamental principles of Judaism. According to Maimonides, who set up the 13 principles of what the Jewish faith really is. And then, the expectation of the Jews was that the return of the king, the king would be like David and that they would be made politically great again, or, similarly, for a leader like Judas Maccabeus, the general of the, uh, the first, he wasn't the oldest son, but he was the middle son, but the great general who had uh, been successful in overcoming the Seleucids and freeing them during that time, and that they would drive out the oppressors and again bring freedom. So much of this messianic expectation was a political expectation, that their political oppressors would be defeated and driven off, and they would be made a great country, a great nation, again, politically. So we have to understand that that was the expectation. Now, Jesus comes along. And in many ways, he looked like he might be the Messiah. First, he was a Jew. He was a descendant of David. And he met all of the other kind of particular prophetic requirements. Um, some people say there are as many as 600 different references in the Old Testament that can, can be interpreted as... Uh, prophetic uh, predictions of the coming of Jesus. Things like he was born of a virgin, he was born in Bethlehem, etc. Okay. It's also true that Jesus was a good Jew for the most part. He observed the Jewish law and the traditions. Now, he challenged some of them, like the Sabbath regulations. Um, it certainly is true that Jesus defended all the moral aspects of the law, but he challenged some of the priestly aspects, like you know, they weren't supposed to pick even heads of grain to eat on Sunday, or they weren't supposed to heal anybody on a Sunday, and all of those kinds of things that Jesus blatantly challenged. But for the most part, he observed the law and traditions. He frequently quoted from the Law and the Prophets. Jesus quotes the Old Testament um, extensively, as do his followers later on throughout the Bible. In fact, one of the reasons why Protestants do not accept the Apocrypha, you know, the Apocrypha mm -hmm. are the books that were written during the Hasmonean period, during the Maccabean period, uh, in between the two testaments, after the end of Malachi, which was the 400s BC, before the writing of uh, the first of the books of the New Testament, there's a period in which some history books were written about the war against the Seleucids. The, the apocryphal books are mostly, well, they are all from that time, but it's mostly about that struggle. And uh, one of the reasons that they're not accepted as being part of the canon by Protestants, part of the Bible by Protestants, is that nowhere are they quoted in the New Testament. Every other book of the Old Testament is quoted somewhere, or referred to somewhere, but not any of the Apocrypha. The other reason is because the Jews don't accept that as part of Scripture. You know, the Jews don't even think that that's part of God's canon. They rejected all of that in the Council of Jamnia in AD 90. So the Jews don't accept it as part of God's Word. Nowhere is it quoted in the New Testament. The Protestants said, we don't believe that's part of the Bible. It's interesting, and it's worthwhile reading just for interest and for history, but it's not part of the Bible. The Catholics and the Orthodox Church have both established different, they have different sets. You know, they don't agree on all of them, but they hold that as part of the Bible as well. Um, Jesus frequented the synagogues and the temple. He spoke in the synagogues where the Jews gathered. Um, he was considered a rabbi, a teacher. Rabbis were not ordained positions, they were just people who demonstrated the knowledge of God's word and an ability to teach. That's what rabbi doesn't mean priest, it means teacher. And so Jesus was called rabbi by some people because he was recognized as a teacher and often would speak in the synagogues, especially in Galilee. Jesus was clear that his ministry was first to the Jews. Jesus' priority was the Jewish people before any Gentiles. 
I talked about that in a previous class, that when the first Gentile woman, the widow of Zarephath, who comes to him and says, heal my daughter, Jesus says, I have to worry about the children before I can take care of the dogs. He means I have to, my mission is first to the Jews, then it will be to the Gentiles. They come second. And the Jews loved that about him. His ministry was first to the Jews. The Jews rejected him, and so that was the time in which you know, the, the promise that God made to, to bless all nations um, was fulfilled in Jesus making this available to everyone. We're going to talk about the ministry to Gentiles a little later today. It's also true that Jesus performed miracles. He was clearly gifted by God as a leader and a teacher. He drove out demons. He healed diseases. This was a pretty strong qualification for him being the Messiah. He was a miracle worker, clearly blessed by God with power. They didn't know at first that he actually was God. You know, they thought that he just had been blessed by God. And then... His transfiguration, which I've talked about in the last couple of classes, has been one of the most significant of all events. Thomas Aquinas called it the most significant miracle in which, uh, and the complement to his baptism, whereas his baptism by John the Baptist was an identification with the sinfulness and humanity of the human race. Transfiguration was a glimpse of heaven in which he spoke to Moses and Elijah. While speaking to Moses and Elijah, two of the most important figures of the Old Testament, <clears throat> sort of locked him in in terms of being very Jewish. So all of these, and miraculous as well, he was talking to two dead guys who had been major leaders in the history of God's people, who, who were still alive somewhere and appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration and talked to Jesus. So this was very significant. But at the same time, while there were many things that gave Jesus cred as the Messiah, there were a number of things that didn't and that caused people to oppose him, and particularly to reject the idea that he was the Messiah. First, he was not the political leader like King David or Judas Maccabeus that they expected. He showed no inclination at all, even when they tried to push him to it, to do anything to discount or discredit or speak against or fight back against the Romans. And when they tried to make him, like ask him, you know, do we, should we pay taxes to Rome? Um, trying to trick him because they knew if he said, no, you shouldn't, then the Romans would arrest him. If they said, yes, you should, then the Jews would be mad at him because they didn't want to pay taxes to Rome. Jesus does this brilliant thing. He says, do you have a coin? And they, at that, I'm sure at that point they went, oh, he's going to do it again, isn't he? <laughs> they gave him a coin, and he looks at it and goes, whose picture is that? And they say, Caesar's. And he says, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. And I always picture him flipping the coin back to him. <laughs> which, which he did in the miniseries The Bible. He flipped the coin. Actually, he flipped the coin to a Roman To a Roman, to a Roman yeah. soldier. He gave to Rome what was Rome, yeah. So, um, you know, cool. but that, that issue is he did not question or challenge Rome, which was what they expected the Messiah to do, perhaps more than anything else. Secondly, he spoke on his own authority. And very early on, people are saying, we've never heard anybody talk like this. The Jewish tradition was you always quote somebody else. You quote Rambam, you know, Maimonides, if you're, more, if you're later on, or you quote one of the earlier rabbis or the earlier priests there were two different schools in Jesus' day of, of uh, Jewish training. There was the school of Hillel and there was the school of Shammai. And they differed in terms of how they interpreted. But you always quoted somebody else, but not Jesus. Jesus said, I say unto you. In fact, he often would say, you have read or you have heard it said. And then he would quote somebody else or quote the scripture. And he said, but I say unto you, not that he ever disagreed with scripture, but he clarified it. He interpreted it. He spoke on his own authority, rather than say, thus saith the Lord, which means this is in the Bible, basically. This is what Scripture says. This is what God has spoken already through Moses or the prophets. Jesus said, I say to you, and claimed authority that nobody else had ever done in the Jewish faith. And they really had a problem with that. Then he claimed himself personally to be the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. His first appearance in Nazareth, he reads from the book of Isaiah about the coming of the Messiah, and he stops and rolls up the scroll and hands it back and says, Today, in your hearing, this prophecy has been fulfilled. <gasps> this is why they accused him later of blasphemy. Because he said he was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. You didn't go around doing that if you were a Jew. Right? You just didn't. He then broke some of the rules. Like he healed on the Sabbath, he allowed his workers to, his workers, his, his friends and followers, to pick grain and eat it on the Sabbath, which was a, technically a violation of the law. 
he predicted that the temple, the marvelous temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. At least that's what they thought, he said. He said, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it again in three days. And he meant his body, the temple of the Holy Spirit. But they interpreted it, because he was in Jerusalem in front of the temple when he said it, as being he's going to destroy the temple. Now they had a special um, affinity for the temple. They believed it was God's home on earth. It was the, his throne room. And the whole Maccabean rebellion had been focused on more than any other single thing, had been focused on reclaiming and re-cleansing and rededicating the temple. That's what Hanukkah is all about. The Jewish celebration of Hanukkah, which comes near our Christmas time, it's the celebration of lights when they relit, when they cleansed and rededicated and lit the lights, once again, the lamps once again, in the temple. So since the Maccabeans, which is just 100, 100, 150 years before this, the temple was a huge deal. And when they thought Jesus was saying, I'm going to destroy the temple, uh-uh, not going to let that happen. And that was one of the accusations they made against him during his trial before the Sanhedrin. Then Jesus also hung around with a bad crowd, including tax collectors and sinners. He was anointed by prostitutes. I mean, he, he did not have very good judgment in this kind of <laughs> according to their idea. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned to this group, I've mentioned it before, that uh, one of my professors in college who was a Christian and taught Bible studies, he said when he first came to the college and he went to the student Bible study, there was a young man, very clean-cut young man, who was leading the Bible study. And he read the part of where the Pharisees are criticizing Jesus for being the tax collectors and sinners. And this young man's interpretation of that was, see, even Jesus was not as careful as he should have been about who, who he hung around with. So you need to be more careful than that. Okay? That's not what that passage means. Okay. Jesus' concern was for those who were broken and hurting and lost. He said it's not the, the well who need a physician, but the sick. That's why he is called the great physician. Those who were spiritually sick are the ones he came for, and those especially were those who were blatant sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, you know, the ones that the Pharisees, the righteous Jews, said you should never be seen around. Jesus hung out with those folks and liked them, apparently. Um, then Jesus openly criticized the Jewish religious leaders. He was not ever reluctant to poke them right in their big fat prideful eye about the claims that they made to be the righteous. He told, he told stories like the prayer of the tax collector and the prayer of the Pharisee. You know, that the Pharisee prays, looks to heaven and says, God, I thank you I'm not like other people. You know, the, and that the, you've made me righteous, and I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of everything. I'm not like that that dumb old tax collector over there. And the tax collector would not even come close, but stands off at a distance and looks down and beats his chest and says, "God, have mercy on me, a sinner." And in the presence of Pharisees, Jesus said, "I tell you, you know, I tell you that it is that man, the tax collector, who went home justified, and not the Pharisee." He did that all the time. And so he was, he was bucking the religious establishment in such a way, how could he be the Messiah if he wasn't going along with the program of what the Jewish religion was all about? He then also, because he, um, he was fighting against the Jewish authorities, the Romans were always, they gave a great deal of freedom to the people who were under them with one particular, well, two exceptions. If you didn't pay your taxes, they came down on you hard. And if there was any trouble, if there was a riot, if there was, if there was a revolt, if there was any kind of problem, they would step in immediately. And there was a concern that because Jesus would have followers and he was fighting against the, the Jewish authorities, which the Romans had allowed to stay in place, that they might see that as so much trouble that the Romans would step in and, and interfere uh, with the whole running of, of the Israel, of the nation of Israel. Okay. Then he claimed to be the Son of God, and that was a problem for them. That was considered blasphemy. And people who used to say, especially small college professors who used to say, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God, he claimed to be the Son of Man. I'm sorry, but they haven't read it carefully. He does claim to be the Son of God, and particularly he never corrects anyone who does call him the Son of God. When Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he says, Peter, it's not any human <coughs> intelligence that gave you that knowledge, but that comes from God, the Father in heaven. You know, when, when Thomas says, my Lord and my God, he doesn't go, no, 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 Thomas, that's, that's going too far. 
No, he doesn't. He always accepts the acknowledgement. When Caiaphas, the high priest, during the first trial, when Jesus doesn't answer any questions, finally the question that Caiaphas puts to him is, are you the son of God? Jesus says, yes, it is as you say. I am the son of God, and you will see the son of man, which was, was his favorite title for himself, but you read Daniel 7 to know that the son of man was the one that would be given all authority and all power uh, for all eternity. Right? The son of man was a prophetic messianic image in Daniel 7. And he says, you will see the son of man coming in the clouds of glory. Right? So very clearly, Jesus said he was the son of God. And the biggest problem was he really was the son of God. The devil didn't like it. There was more than just human uh, opposition to Jesus. All of the spiritual forces of evil were against him and were inspiring Caiaphas and Judas Iscariot and all of the others. When the gospel said that the devil came upon Judas Iscariot, which at the final point of his betrayal. And so they rejected him. They re the Jews rejected Jesus. Now, not all the Jews, but the majority of the Jews rejected Jesus as not being what he claimed to be, the Messiah. Now, having said that, that most of the Jews rejected Jesus, not all of them. We have to see that the very first Christians, there were several groups of them, and all of them were Jews. All of the early Christians were Jews. First, there were those Christians uh, that were first century Jews, all of them from humble birth, as Jesus was, who had begun to follow Jesus during his lifetime. This is not just the 12, which we think about, but there were the 70 that Jesus also sent out, and there were many others that became followers of Jesus, men and women, who believed in him and had started following him during his lifetime. Then, following the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, those early followers were confirmed in their belief because they saw Jesus come back from the dead, which is pretty convincing. If you know for sure that he was dead, which they did, the Romans were very good at what they did when it came to crucifying people. They didn't make mistakes about that. This idea that Jesus just swooned, there's no historicity to that, there's no likelihood of it, because the Romans did not crucify people and then take them down before they were dead. In fact, they would break their legs uh, to make sure that they were dead, because when somebody was crucified, if you broke their legs so that they could no longer support themselves, they suffocated faster. Because crucifixion, you die by suffocation. Your lungs can no longer support themselves, and they fill with fluid, and you die from not being able to breathe. That's why it's such a painful death. Okay. Jesus' case, they were so sure he was dead, they jabbed him in the side with a, with a lance, and clearly he was dead, so they didn't even have to break his legs, which was a fulfillment of the prophecy that none of his bones would be broken. But they knew he was dead when they buried him. Okay. Um, so those who were his followers and others who were there and witnessed the resurrected Christ, because there were other witnesses. There were a lot of people who, who uh, witnessed his ascension into heaven, which would, again, be a pretty convincing thing. You watch him rise up into the clouds of heaven, promising to come back in the same way at some point. Um, then we come to Pentecost. We're going to talk about that. Pentecost was the, the Jewish celebration of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. It happens 50 days, that's why Penta cost, 50, Penta, 50 days after the Passover. Basically, when the Israelites came out of uh, Egypt, the Exodus, they, they, they had the Passover right before they leave the, the nation of Egypt. They come into the desert, 40 days later they arrive at the base of Mount Sinai, Moses goes up on the mountain and receives the law. Well, the law was so important to them that in addition to Passover being the biggest festival of the year, 40 or 50 days later, there is an additional um, festival, which is the Festival of Pentecost, to celebrate the giving of the law. And that was the event in which Jews, after Jesus' uh, ascension, it actually Jesus uh, rose from the dead, he went 40 days teaching and was ascended, and then 10 more days, 10 days later, Pentecost comes. That's where the 50 days come between Passover, when Jesus was crucified and resurrected, and Pentecost. So Pentecost occurs, Jews from all over, almost the known world, certainly all over the eastern Mediterranean and as far away as Rome, have come to uh, Jerusalem for the Pentecost celebration, 
those Jews had all been out there because of the Jewish diaspora. That's a word you need to know, diaspora, because we're going to use it twice today in two different references. Diaspora means the scattering or the dispersion. Because of the Jewish, um, the Jews being oppressed for so many years by so many different groups of people, and most recently in the 500s BC by the Babylonians, the Babylonian captivity, when they carried them off, three different groups of them, three different times, they carried uh, uh, Israeli, or, uh, Israelites, the, the Jews, off into captivity. They lived for over 60 years in captivity before the Persians conquered Babylon and said, you can go back home. And not, not really that many of them at first went back home. Many of them stayed in Babylon, and from there they spread out. They were free to go wherever they wanted. And so you had Jews all over the known world. There were Jewish communities and synagogues everywhere. And in many cases, there were really large communities. By the, by the first century, one-third of the population of Alexandria in Egypt were Jews. And Alexandria was the second biggest city in the Roman Empire. So there were Jews everywhere. The day of Pentecost was one of the festivals in which they came back to Jerusalem for the celebration. And if you have a study Bible, an NIV study Bible, you might want to turn to page 1826 because there's a great little map there. I didn't copy it for this. Maybe I will before we post this where it shows arrows from all over the known world. It's the Eastern Mediterranean, but again, as far um, to the west as Rome, as far to the east as uh, Medea and other, uh, other countries that were Persia and east of there, they all came together in one place. That Jewish diaspora, the scattering out of the Jews that had happened previously, especially in the Babylonian captivity, became critically important for the spread of the Christian faith. We'll talk about that. And then finally, empowered by the Holy Spirit, Peter preaches the first great Christian evangelistic message in the second chapter of Acts, after being empowered by the Spirit and having the speaking in tongues that everybody notices and everybody's paying attention. He preaches, and 3,000 people come to a saving knowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. That is the birth of the church per se, because it is after the resurrection of Jesus, 10 days after Jesus' ascension into heaven even, and it is where the church really gets launched. Let's talk about that. Let's look at some of the passages. This is from the second chapter of Acts, first verse. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, that is, they being the disciples. There were about a hundred of them, it's believed. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they ask each other, what does this mean? Now, this part, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, that was all east, some of it considerably east, you know, the far parts of the Persian, ancient Persian Empire. Uh, Judea, which is right there, you know, they're people from local. Cappadocia, which was Central Asia Minor, what we know of as Turkey. Pontus and Asia, you know, further out yet, east. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, this is part of Africa. Uh, visitors from Rome, so we've got Europeans here. Um, Cretans from the island of Crete, uh, Arabs. There are people from all over. And again, if you have a, a NIV study Bible, page 1826, is worth checking out. All of these different Jews from who were who were in all these places because of the diaspora, the spreading out from past persecutions and exiles and whatnot, 
we're back in Jerusalem to hear the sermon. And it continues. Then, and th I've broken this up because this is a longer passage. I've cut out part of Peter's sermon because I don't feel, feel you need to get converted. The point I'm trying to make here is the historical one. So, uh, from later on in the second chapter, a couple of different passages. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Jumping down to verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. There's a passage in there about him being crucified. Freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. <coughs> now there's a revival meeting. Okay. This was the birth of the church. Now, the important part of this is all of these Jews who had come into Jerusalem from all over the known world 3,000 of them hear, G hear Peter preach. They accept that Jesus is the Messiah and Lord. And then what do they do? They go home. And they take the message with them. So we have not only the 3,000 who were converted that day, but these people then go out from there and begin to share this information, this knowledge with other people. Um, we'll come back to the effect of this this is how the Jewish diaspora became, the spreading out of the Jews became one of the vehicles by which Christianity spread. This event, and then later on, whenever uh, Paul or Philip or Barnabas <coughs> or any of the missionaries would travel out, because they were all Jewish, the first missionaries, the first thing that they would do, including Paul, who was the missionary of the Gentiles, when he got into a new town, as I said before, you know, he'd go to his hotel, unpack his bag, get a good night's sleep, wake up the next morning, have his grapefruit, and then he would go to the synagogue. <laughs> and he would preach to the Jews in the synagogue, because virtually everywhere that he went, there was a community of Jewish people who had a synagogue. And that was the first contact point. And Paul and others who were Jews were welcome there, and because they would always welcome somebody from out of town to come and share with them. Remember, there weren't priests, there weren't ministers who ran everything. They were run by local teachers. Synagogues did not have ordained clergy. Anybody could get up and talk. And so the synagogues that existed all over the known world then were a key connecting place for Paul and the other missionaries who went out. All right? So the Jewish diaspora, both because of Pentecost and also because of just their presence as as targets, you know, as places for connection, became critical to the, um, to the spread of the Jewish faith. Now we have the Apostolic Church, which really was based in Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem was the, the headquarters. It was everything to the Jewish people. It was the heart of the Jews. It was, it was called the navel of the universe. If you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I think I told you all before, you know, it, there's a site there, you go in there and they'll point to it and say, that's, that's the center of the world, right there. Well, they consider it to be the center of the universe. And so Jerusalem was the home, not only for the Jewish faith, but also the starting home for the Christian faith. From the beginning, the very beginning, uh, after Jesus' resurrection, there was a strong church in Jerusalem, made up, again, of people who had followed Jesus during their life, of people who had witnessed the risen Jesus, and then those Jews in Jerusalem who had been converted at Pentecost and later. It was from that Jerusalem church that the faith spread. Interestingly enough, a second way in which God uh, used the Jerusalem church to spread the faith, besides the preaching that, that Peter did, where everybody then returned home after Pentecost and shared the faith, 
God used a conflict amongst the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem to cause the faith to spread. Particularly, the Jewish church, while we have an example, of, Scripture tells us that they, were, they held all things in common and they shared everything. Well, unfortunately, they didn't share everything equally. Because in Acts 6, we have a case where um, two groups of Jewish Christians come to light. And it's because there were two, two groups of Jews. The, this separation, this difference, was between the Hebraic Jews, the ones that were very Jewish, were, you know, that knew Hebrew and thought of themselves as being Jews and hated the Greek influence. You will remember that it's not just Alexander that created the Greek influence, but the Seleucids that had oppressed them prior to the time of the Hasmoneans, the Maccabees and the Hasmoneans, the Seleucids were Greek. They were forcing them to worship Greek gods. They were forcing them to, you know, to go to Greek theater. All kinds of that, that kind of stuff. And so there were Jews who hated the whole Greek influence, not just because of Alexander, but especially because of the Seleucids. And then there were the, the Jews, many of whom may have lived somewhere else where the Greek culture was more acceptable than in Jerusalem, and they had become Hellenized. Many of them had Greek names. Many of them spoke Greek rather than Hebrew. In fact, that's the reason why in the 200s BC they had had to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek. That's what the Septuagint is. They had to translate it into Greek because the Greek culture had become so dominant, a lot of Jews didn't speak Hebrew anymore. Well, in the first century in Jerusalem, the Hellenized Jews, those that were more Greek in their thinking and orientation, maybe even had Greek names, spoke Greek before they did Hebrew, and the Hebraic Jews, those who hated the Hellenizing influence, they fought. Well, some of the Hellenized Jews became Christians. Some of the Greek Jews became Christians. And they still had a problem with each other. In fact, what we have in the sixth chapter of Acts is the indication that when the distribution of food and other services to widows amongst the Christians, because they took care of people, it was determined it wasn't being fairly done. That the Hebraic Jews were getting more than the Hellenized Jews. And so, something had to be done about that. This is the passage from Acts 6. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews... Now, these are all Christians. There were, you know, we're talking about people who were converted Christians, and they're all Jewish. When it says Hellenized, it doesn't mean that they weren't Jewish. They just were under the influence of Greek culture. Uh, complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us, the apostles, to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Even the priests were being converted. Now it is of note that all of these names, Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, and the others, those are Greek names. Those are not Jewish, they're not Hebrew names. So these were Hellenized Jewish men who were named to be the first deacons. A deacon literally means someone who waits on tables. Okay. So the first seven deacons that were appointed were all Hellenized Jews. All of the apostles were Hebraic Jews. And so here you begin to see the balance. Now why do I talk about this when we're talking about the growth of the church, which is our point today? It's because this difference between Hellenized Jews and uh, Hebraic Jews ended up being another reason why the church spread and grew. And it happens when the first persecution begins. The first persecution of the, the Christian church, and they were all Jewish Christians at this point. There were Hellenized Jewish Christians, there were Hebraic Jewish Christians. The first persecution against the Christians was by... <coughs> Jews against the Hellenized Christians. Now, the Sadducees and Pharisees, the Sadducees were mostly Hellenized Christians. 
generally speaking. The Pharisees were very much Hebraic Christians. The Jews? Or, uh, Jews, excuse me, sorry. The, the Sadducees were Hellenized Jews. The Pharisees were Hellenized Christians. Well, when the first persecution started, it's reflected, we find out about it, in the story of Stephen. Stephen is the first of these um, deacons that is named, a man full of the Spirit. Stephen comes into conflict with some of the conservative Jews. He is a Hellenized Jew with a Greek name who is a follower of Jesus. They have a lot against him. And so we have this story from Acts 6. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. He was more than just a waiter on tables. He was a man full of the Holy Spirit who performed miracles, who was a great preacher. The first great sermon we have of the New Testament after Peter's great sermon is this one. It's Stephen. I'm not going to get into all of it today, but it's worth reading. Uh, and also, you will note that Peter and Stephen and Philip and all of these guys who preach the gospel, preach it from the Old Testament. One of the reasons the Old Testament is so important. that The argument they made for the truth of Jesus as the Messiah is all based on Old Testament promises. Okay. Keep going here. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. Jews of Cyrene and Alexander, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then he secretly persuaded they, that's right, then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. The suggestion is, by the way, that these Jews who were Jews of Cyrene in North Africa, Alexandria in Egypt in North Africa, Cilicia and Asia, which was north of them. Okay, Asia would be part of Asia Minor or Turkey. Uh, Cilicia was where the, the curve, just north of the, of the curve of the Mediterranean. Um, Tarsus, where Paul was from, was in Cilicia. These probably were Jews who were from those areas, and because they lived in areas that were away from Jerusalem, they were really adamant about keeping things Jewish and not allowing themselves to be influenced by the Greek culture that was dominant where they came from. So they were reacting against the Jewish culture, the Hebrew, <laughs> the Greek culture in very strong ways. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place, the temple, and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. This continues. There's, there's a period where Stephen gives his great sermon, which is fairly long, so we're not going to get into that, but it, well, I'm going to cut to the very end of his sermon, where Stephen tells it like it is. He says, you stiff-necked people. <laughs> now, Stephen is a Jew, remember, and he's talking to Jews. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. <laughs> <laughs> but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul who would later be Paul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. <clears throat> Which, of course, is a euphemism for death. Stephen was the first martyr of the Christian church. He was martyred because of his testimony of Jesus, 
but also because he was a Hellenized Jew. The reason we say that is because very, very close to this time, Peter and John, when they are preaching, the Sanhedrin call them in and say, you need to stop preaching about this Jesus, and they give him a beating and send them away. Stephen they kill. Why? Because Peter and John and the other apostles, and when, when, when this happens, there is a Christian diaspora. The persecution against the Jewish Christians begins, but it is a persecution specifically against the Hellenized Jewish Christians, and they leave. They leave Jerusalem. They run for it. And we have, we have uh, we'll see it here in a few minutes. They go all over the place. So they're spreading out. And when they spread out, what do they do? They take the message of Jesus with them. It was the Hellenized Christians, Hellenized Jewish Christians, who were being persecuted because the council of Jerusalem, the main leaders of the church, stayed in Jerusalem and were not affected. They were not persecuted. So we know that the Jews were especially after the Hellenized Jewish Christians, not the Hebraic Jewish Christians or at least not nearly so much, not until later on. Okay. Um, one, more, one more slide, and then we will take a break. Can I just ask a question? Sure. Can we go back? Um, yep. Why did they, uh, the witnesses lay their coats at the feet of the young man named Saul? To free their arms up so they could throw the stones. Uh -huh. Saul was a young mm -hmm. Turk of a Jewish, you know, young Jewish leader. He studied under Gamaliel, the greatest teacher of his day. Gamaliel, who was the grandson, I think he was, of Hillel, the great, who had the school of Hillel, you know, one of the great teachers of the Jewish history. Um, very significant that he was this young Jew of Jews. And he was there and witnessed this. They, they, you know, he wasn't taking part in the stoning. But then later, his enthusiasm for getting rid of these Hellenized Jewish Christians caused him to go to the Sanhedrin and ask for a right, writ of uh, persecution, you know, basically writ of arrest, that he could go after these these Jewish Christians, and it, and he was on his way to Damascus to do just that when he uh, has the vision of Jesus. Okay, yes, a couple questions. Okay, um, the first dispersion. I mean, when when these guys uh, not dispersion, but when after the day of Pentecost, when these people heard the gospel and many of them returned back to where they lived. Right. Did not many of them stay in Jerusalem and that create a hospitality crisis among the believers there? Um, I'm not sure. Now, a lot of the Jews who would have heard him would have been from Jerusalem. In fact, it says from Judea. The Jews that were from Jerusalem and the immediately surrounding area um, because there was an attendance home. to people who evidently did not have income. You had, you had this group of people who appeared to be right. pilgrims that were there maybe temporarily but stayed longer, you know, and Yeah, it's possible. I don't I don't have any evidence for that. I mean I'm not unless I'm just not I'm not aware of something, um, that they stayed. Now, the the early church, they went from a hundred to three thousand one hundred like that. And we, we're told that they care for each other's needs. You know, so it would have been a huge burden anyway. Um, if, if only a small percentage of them stayed. But you would have, yeah, you would have to assume that those three thousand were the result of those who heard their message on that day, who are identified as all those people who were had right. come from afar. So there was a. Some of them would be from Jerusalem and Judea and may have stayed around. But uh, again, part of the witness, and, and we have evidence of that because later on, and I'll mention this, Priscilla and Aquila. You know, who became uh, partners with Paul and influenced, and actually taught Apollo, and and some of us believe that Priscilla may have been the author of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Um, they came from Rome long before Paul ever went to Rome, long before Peter went to Rome. Well, how is it that they were Christians from Rome? Because Rome was one of the places right. that the right. people from Pentecost went back to. Apollo was a Christian. Apparently, he needed a little more education about it because Priscilla and Aquila took him under their wing. But he came from Alexandria and was preaching. Mm -hmm. How did he know about the gospel in Alexandria early on? Well, they went. Because that's where they went back to. Other question. Um, oh, yeah. Um, we, when you look at, at this event of Stephen and the stoning and how this was the spark that caused the, the, the how do you call it? Diaspora? Diaspora. Diaspora. And they left as a result. They were pushed out by this persecution. Could, would, it be, would it be sound? That you to consider that you could trace that spark of resistance that goes back to when Peter healed 
Peter and John heal that lame man because there it seems like the whole attitude of the Pharisees, they're saying, we've had enough of this. Now, and they start to they start to change their benign atmosphere or their benign attitude towards the, these believers, and they 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 they, they arrest them, and they let them go. But right. later they put them in prison, and it's like the whole thing changes because this one lame man was healed. And a whole lot of people have been healed, but this was like to me, it's almost like the straw that breaks the thumb of the right. back. And then from there on, you see this progression that adds to this. Yeah, I mean, there's a building up, obviously, you know, that, uh, but one of the things that most people I don't think realize is that there appears to have been a difference in how the Jewish authorities responded to the Hellenized Jewish Christians versus right. Right. The, the Hebraic Jewish Christians. And it's consistent all the way along. I mean, the conflict between the, the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, between the difficulty with the dis distribution of food to the different groups, the, the, this is a, a major theme throughout the whole history. And it appears to be consistent in terms of how the persecution happened, the first uh, persecution against Christians, that they seem to be targeting especially the, the Hellenized. Uh, so are we looking, at, we looking at the early uh, racism? Well, it's, a, it's kind of a, it's an anti-Semitism yeah. by Jews against Jews. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, let's look at one more passage and then we'll take a break. Well, join first. Okay. What did the word church begin and how? And what does it really mean, the definition? Right. Um, the original, um, you know, synagogue was a meeting place, and they sort of took that idea, you know, the idea of Kirk. It, it basically meant the meeting, you know, a meeting place. Uh, first, it meant not a building, not when I say meeting place, it was just a gathering. It's when they got together, and, you should, and initially it was at home. So we'll talk about that a little bit you know, in the second hour. Let me give you one more passage, and then we'll take a break. Here we have the next passage after what we just read. This is the start of chapter 8. Remember, they had laid his, the garments, that they took their cloaks off and laid them at Saul's feet. And Saul approved of their killing him, Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The apostles represented the, the leaders, but they were the Hebraic leaders. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Mm -hmm. God used this persecution and the diaspora, the spreading out from the persecution, as a way to spread the message. Philip went down to a city. Philip is another one of these Hellenized Jews. Hellenized Jewish Christians, that is. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When, they heard the, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Okay? We're going to take a break now. And when we come back, we'll talk about the spread to the Gentiles. Let's talk now about the expansion of the faith to the Gentiles. Again, it started with the Hebraic Christians. All of those that were immediate followers of Jesus were Hebraic Christians. It spread to the or Hebraic Jews, excuse me. Then it spread to the uh, Hellenized Jews. Then the persecution against the church by the, by the Jewish authorities, especially targeted toward the Hellenized Jews. Uh, that were Christians, and they started spreading out. But then we have, in Acts 9 and 10, we're introduced to um, several players that were sort of linchpins in the expansion of the faith to Gentiles. Interestingly enough, these early players in the expansion of the Christian faith to Gentiles were not Paul. Paul, obviously, there's more said about Paul in the book of Acts, which is the story of the growth of the church, than any other single person. Um, partly because Luke was a close friend of his and traveled with him, and that's not to take anything away from Paul. You know, Paul is certainly one of the most significant figures in the church. But sometimes I think we think Paul was the one who took the gospel to the Gentiles, and he wasn't. At least he wasn't the only one. Um, we just saw Philip, you know, going into Samaria, and these people were half Jews. But there are churches that are beginning to be established. The first um, converts. Gentile converts to Christianity that we're aware of were not because of the ministry of Paul, but rather of Peter. We have in Acts 10 this story. 
At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He was an officer in the Roman army. He and all of his family were devout and God-fearing. That term, God-fearing, is a technical term. It means they were not Jews, they were Gentiles, but they had come to believe in one God. They were monotheistic. In this day, and this is, this is the, the next... You know, I'll come back to this. This is one of the next most important reasons why Christianity grew is that there was a population of God-fearing Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire. Gentiles who had gotten to the point where they didn't believe in the pantheon of Roman or Greek gods anymore and they didn't accept the mystery religions. They believed there was one God and they were looking for it. And the only people they could go to to find out about him, the only people who believed in one God, were monotheistic, were the Jews. And those Gentiles who were interested in the Jewish faith because they were interested in monotheism were called God-fearing Jews. Okay? It's a fairly technical term in the original language. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. It takes a lot to make a Roman centurion afraid. <laughs> what is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel spoke to him, and the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his attendants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. They told him everything that had happened and sent him, sent them to Joppa. Okay? What happens here is Cornelius the Gentile sends two of his servants, who would have been Gentiles, to see Paul. Or I'm sorry, see Peter. <laughs> Peter is has been traveling from Jerusalem. He travels up, he you know heals people along the way. He ends up on the coastal town of Joppa. He's staying there. And while he is in the house one afternoon, he's up on the Mirador, and he and Peter has a vision. He sees a giant sheet filled with all kinds of animals, both clean and unclean, and it's lowered from heaven. He sees this happen three times, and then a voice from God says, Peter, take and eat. And Peter goes, no way! Since I was a child, I have never eaten any unclean animals. You know, there would have been pigs and lizards and, you know, snakes and all kinds of stuff, I guess. Shellfish, which are not kosher. And Peter said, I've never eaten anything unclean since I was a child. And God's voice says, Peter, don't you call anything unclean that I have said is clean. At that moment, the vision ends, and he hears somebody calling from outside. Peter goes downstairs, and standing outside the gate are these servants that have come from Caesarea, which is where Cornelius, the Roman centurion, was. Caesarea, Caesarea Maritima it was called, was the center, uh, administrative and military center for the Roman army in Palestine, which was north of Joppa on the coast. They had come down, they're standing outside the gate because Jews were not allowed to accept Gentiles into their home. Gentiles wouldn't go into a Jewish home and vice versa. Peter comes out on the porch and says, what can I do for you? These two servants tell him about their master, Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion who had a vision from God, he's a God-fearing Gentile, to come and find Peter and bring him back. Peter says, come on in. That act broke the rule against Jews and Gentiles being together. The vision that Peter had his welcoming of the two Gentile servants into the home where he was staying was his home, Simon Tanner's home. The next day, Peter goes with them back up to Caesarea, they go, and he walks into the house of Cornelius the Gentile, which he was not supposed to do as a Jew. He listens to Cornelius talk about what God has said to him. He tells them about Jesus. They accept Jesus, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. These are the first Gentile converts, because God sent Peter and said, don't you call anything unclean, animals and the Gentiles, that I say is clean. This was the first breakthrough that happened, all right? Uh, the first Gentile believers, and they came through Peter, who's, off, who's usually called the, you know, the apostle to the Jews, and Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul actually refers to the two of them that way, but 
Many Jews came to the faith through Paul, and many Gentiles, or some Gentiles at least, through Peter. So it's not hard and fast. Then we have this passage in Acts 11. We go on to the next phase. Um, now those who were being scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, this is the Christian diaspora, because of the Jewish persecution after Stephen's stoning. When Stephen was killed, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Phoenicia was northern coast, Cyprus was the island, Antioch was the city in the north, Syria. Spreading the word only among Jews. Again, at first it was only Jews they were talking to. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, which is down in Libya, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also. Greek here is a, is a word for Gentiles. It doesn't mean they're all from Greece. It means they're non-Jews. They're Gentiles. Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was on them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw that the grace of God, what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, who would become Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for the whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Antioch is a Gentile city. There was, a, there were, like most major cities, and this was the third biggest city in the Roman Empire, uh, like, like most major cities, there would have been a large Jewish population, but it was a predominantly Gentile city. This is a Gentile church. Gentiles have accepted Jesus. Barnabas has affirmed that. He's gone and gotten Saul, who, is, who has been converted some years ago and has been studying. They come back, they sort of start leading this church in Antioch, this predominantly Gentile church. This is how the church began through Peter's ministry to Cornelius, through Philip traveling to the technically non-Jewish area in Samaria, and then also the Antioch church, um, which was supported by Barnabas and Saul. Now, we then have a major event in the history of the church, which does several things. It is the Council of Jerusalem, which is recorded in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. Remember now, we've got Gentiles in Antioch who are Christians, worshiping Jesus. We read the first verse of chapter 15 of Acts. Certain people came down from Judea. Now, down from Judea. Judea is south. But anytime you come from Jerusalem, you go down. Jerusalem was considered the high... You could go from Jerusalem to the top of Everest. You would still be going down. Okay? <laughs> Jerusalem was the peak. It was the pinnacle. Anywhere you go from Jerusalem, you go down. Anywhere you go from to go to Jerusalem, you go up. It's always going up to Jerusalem. Okay? So, from Ju uh, they came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul, notice he's now called Paul, Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem, south, up to Jerusalem, to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they were traveling through Phoenicia and Samaria, which is, Antioch is in Syria, further north, then Phoenicia along the coast, and Samaria before you get down to Judea and Jerusalem, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all, the, made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Now Saul and Barnabas, or Paul and Barnabas, had already had their first missionary journey where they left Antioch, which was their base of operations, you know, and then visited Cyprus and then went up to the southern coast of Asia Minor, what we knew as Turkey. They visited churches in Derby and Lystra and you know other areas, Antioch of, of Antioch of uh, sorry, Syria. Sir, no, not Antioch of Syria. Antioch of Pisidia. I'm laughing because Bob's back there fighting bugs. Uh, sorry. <laughs> And, and back again. So they had come back, and this whole time, they're planting churches in Gentile cities in Asia Minor. 
So they come back and find out when they get back that these Judaizers, as they're called, had come behind them to Antioch and said, you have to follow the Mosaic Law or you can't really be a follower of Jesus. This was such a big deal, they said, we got to go to Jerusalem and talk to you know, the big boys, the guys who were in charge of the church in Jerusalem, the, the home church, the, the board of elders in session of the Christian faith at that time. So they go down to Jerusalem. And we pick it up now in verse 12, after they've talked about all of this. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. This is on their first missionary journey as well as in Antioch. When they finished, James spoke up. This is not James, the brother of John. He has already been killed. He was the first apostle to be martyred. He was the second martyr to the Christian faith we know of after Stephen. James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, was killed early. This is James the Just, he's called. Sometimes called James the Lesser, but he was such a significant character, it seems a shame to call him James the Lesser. James the Just, who was the half-brother of Jesus, a son of Mary by Joseph, not by the Holy Spirit. That's why he's a half-brother. He had become the head of the Jerusalem Council when Peter... Uh, Peter had been arrested, he miraculously was released from prison, and then he left town on a missionary journey, partly so he wouldn't be arrested again, God called him out of town, and James the Just had taken over the Jerusalem Council as the head. So that's who talks here. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon, Peter that is, Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. Peter was the first one to have Gentile converts, Cornelius and his family. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. What James is saying here, and they write a letter and send it out, is... You Gentiles do not have to become Jewish to be a follower of Jesus. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to follow the dietary law. You do not have to follow the Mosaic law. The reason he mentions these things is not because they needed to do that to be saved, but because they needed to do that to keep from blowing their witness. These are things that if the Jews saw them still doing this, these are the things the Jewish hated most about the Gentiles that they ate food sacrifice to idol, that they were sexually immoral because some of the pagan cults called for that. They had, you know, uh, temple prostitutes. Um, they would eat the meat of strangled animals instead of the Jews would always bleed the animals and make sure it was, it was, all the blood was out before they would butcher it, okay? These were the things the Jews held against the Gentiles. What James is saying here and what the council in Jerusalem agreed with James on is don't do things that are going to be so offensive to the Jews that they won't want to listen to you about Jesus. This is a matter of evangelism. Don't blow your witness by doing things the Jews are going to be crudely offended by. Not that you have to do these things in order to be a Christian. You got that? Does that make sense? And that's why he says, the reason is because for the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues. All the Jews keep focusing on this, so don't, don't do this or you'll just offend them and they'll never come to believe in Jesus. There still was a sense in which the Jews were still a primary audience for the gospel. Okay? So the Council of Jerusalem does two things. One, it makes it possible for Gentiles to be followers of Jesus, to believe in the one true God who came to earth in Jesus who was the Christ, without having to become Jews. The other thing it did was it formalized the organization of the church. That the council in Jerusalem, which was made up of the apostles who were still alive, led by James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus, that they organized the structure of the church. And from there we end up with elders being appointed, you know, because this was the board of elders, Later on, Paul would appoint elders in various places where he, looks, uh, he uh, planted churches, modeled after the board of elders in Jerusalem. Frequently, there would be one senior elder, which later on started to be called a bishop. All right? That's where the Episcopal model of church, bishop, uh, is, is epis, episkopos is the is Greek word for bishop. So the Episcopal model, or bishop model, came from this idea that you had one senior elder. So the church is organized. 
The model for the future of the Christian church is really affirmed here at the Jerusalem Council. And also they established that, that Gentiles can be Christians without becoming Jews. Now that was really, really important. Let me tell you why. I now want to give you the four, I believe, major reasons for the rapid initial growth of Christianity. I believe there are four of them. First, the Jewish converts to Christianity at Pentecost took their faith and their witness back home, and others were converted. And those others that were converted initially were Jews. So the fact that you know the, they went back home and took the witness that the Messiah had been born, and he was more than just a leader, he was the Son of God, bless you, um, they witnessed to that, and then we have examples. Again, Priscilla and Aquila came from Rome and were already believers. Apollo came from Alexandria and was already a believer. These are the results of those first day of Pentecost converts going back to these all these different areas and witnessing to the truth. Now, related to that, when all of these people went back home, we they went back to establish Jewish communities where there were Jews who had this messianic expectation who had all of this background, who knew about the promise to Abraham, who understood that God had chosen his people and eventually would redeem his people through a Messiah. So this Jewish diaspora, the scattering or the dispersion, which had happened over centuries, but especially in the 6th century, the 500s, during the Babylonian captivity, these uh, Jews were everywhere. And so they received the witness of the people coming back from Pentecost, they also ended up being the places that Paul and Peter and others went to, as I said, right away they would focus on the synagogues as the first place. Paul, even though he was the evangelist to the Gentiles, would go to the synagogue, preach to the Jews, explain from the Old Testament why Jesus was the fulfillment, and then in the afternoon he would go down to the Gentile marketplace and he would preach there. The touch point was always the Jewish synagogues, and so the diaspora was critical for several reasons. The third reason, I think, was the diaspora of the Jewish Christians, the Hellenistic Jewish Christians especially, after the stoning of Stephen, the fact that they spread out and went to all these different places means that they carried the message with them. God, in, in so many of these cases, used what was perceived as a terrible thing, persecution, exile, to lay the foundation and to create a network by which the truth of the gospel could be ministered and, and shared with people. And then finally, and this comes back to the, the story of Cornelius, who was a God-fearing Jew, and also to the Council of Jerusalem. A large number of God-fearing Gentiles, that is, non-Jews who were attracted to monotheism, were around the empire. Pretty much everywhere there was a synagogue, there probably were at least a few, if not a lot, of these Gentiles. These Gentiles, who were Greek-influenced, even if they were Romans, they were influenced by the Greek culture, they would come to the, the synagogues, this Jewish faith, and they would say, we really like this idea of one God, and it sounds really good, but you're telling me I have to have part of my anatomy taken off if I'm going to become a Jew? <laughs> <laughs> to the Greek-influenced people, the Greek culture, that was an atrocity. The Greeks, you know, almost worshipped the human form. All these Greek gods, these Greek statues, the idea that you have to sever part of your anatomy in order to become a Jew, to be part of this monotheistic faith, and then you can't eat shellfish, you can't eat pork, and you can't work on... Okay, you got too many rules. I like the part about there being one God, and I like the sound of that God, but you got too many rules. I'm not prepared to do that. I want to keep all my parts. <laughs> Now, with all of these God-fearing Jews, or Gentiles, these God-fearing people who wanted to believe in one God but were unwilling to do what the Jews required to become a Jew, they're now told, you can worship that God by worshiping him through his son Jesus, and you don't have to have all the rest of that. You don't have to have your foreskin removed. You don't have to give up pork. You know, you like bacon? That's okay. You can have bacon. Like a Jewish friend of mine said when we were having our Easter service, we invited him and we said, hey, it's free breakfast, we'll give you pancakes and bacon. And he went, oh, the Jewish dilemma, free bacon. <laughs> <laughs> you can keep eating bacon. Okay, all of these things, the God-fearing Jews said, where were you last week? You know, This is what they've been waiting for. There was this pool 
of people just waiting for the Jewish or for the Christian message. So I think all four of these reasons, the Jewish diaspora, the fact they were everywhere, the fact that after Pentecost, all these people who were visiting Jerusalem went back home, the fact that that created synagogues and locations that, that Paul and others could visit when he traveled, the fact that the Hellenistic Jewish Christians under persecution had spread out with their message, uh, and then the fact that there was this pool, and I, I think our book talks about that, this pool of God-fearing Gentiles throughout the whole Roman Empire who liked the idea of one God, but were not prepared to do what it took to become a Jew. And they were just waiting for the Christian message. The result of that is that this is the areas that we have established as having had Christian communities by A.D. 70. Mm -hmm. This is less than 40 years after the death of Jesus. Okay, or right at 40 years. All of these areas, you'll notice Asia Minor, which today is 98% Muslim. Right. <laughs> and the Holy Land, and we believe there were communities in around Alexandria, because again, that's where Apollo came from. Cyrene, over here in parts we have around Rome and other parts of uh, here, which would be uh, northern Greece. Uh, this is A.D. 70. We know that there are communities in all those places that profess Christianity. You know, churches. Yes? How and when did the synagogue start? The synagogue started during the Babylonian captivity because they no longer had the temple. Okay. They created the synagogue system in order to have a place to... They didn't do sacrifice in the synagogue. They didn't believe that was appropriate. But they could pray. They could teach. They could use it as a community center so that the Jews didn't lose their identity as Jewish people. And that, that, there had been synagogues, that is, places where people would gather for prayer and not formal worship, informal worship, um, away from the temple earlier, but there really wasn't an organized system. That system was organized during the Babylonian captivity between uh, 500 BC and the time of Jesus. Okay. So, yes? Do you have a time frame on like. Okay, the Jerusalem Council, what about that was, but when, like, like Cornelius and all that stuff, from the time of Pentecost until, until the, the, the Gentiles started actually getting reached, is there, is there any sense of the time? Yeah, there is. Uh, actually, I had given you a... At the start of the class, I had that time frame, and there were some things at the bottom of it. Oh, let me see if I can find it. Um, the dates that I have. Does anybody have that in front of you? 34 AD, Stephen Martyr was the last. What's that? 34 AD, Stephen Martyr was the first. Okay. The only thing, the last thing you had on it. Well, 34 AD, Stephen is martyred, and that's also when Saul is converted. So, um, in the 40s, late 40s is when Paul really starts to be active. And so, you begin to get that. He would have been in the 40s, probably, that Cornelius. Uh, happened so all of this is fairly close to the time of Jesus within a decade, decade and a half. Okay. Now another slide. This is the growth of Christianity at the end of the first century. That's 100 A.D. and at the end of the second century. All of these green areas is where Christianity was established. It wasn't necessarily legal yet. Next week we're going to talk about persecution. Uh, the, the first of the Roman persecutions, which happened under Nero, and it, that happened in the first century, but it wasn't, the initial persecution under Nero was primarily in Rome, and, and, and a little bit outside that, but it was mostly Rome. But this green area is all the end of the first century Christianity existed there. The brown area here is by the end of the second century, and it goes way over here, you know, into what we know of as Russia, for instance. Egypt. Uh, this area in Numidia, uh, near Mauritania in North Africa. So within 170 years maximum, the whole eastern Mediterranean basin and much of Europe is Christianized. Christianity is not the legal religion yet. It was not made legal until the early 300s. And so there's periodic limited persecutions that happen throughout that time, which we'll talk about next week. But they're also, uh, and, and Constantine made it legal to be a Christian. He did not make it, most people get this wrong, he did not make it the legal religion of the empire. That didn't happen until quite a bit later under Theodosius. Uh, but I also want to say, since we're talking about the apostolic era, what happened to the apostles? Okay? Most of what happened to the apostles is not good. I'm sorry to say. 
Um, get my notes organized here, sorry. Um, we don't know most of this for a fact. We have traditional references, but we don't, you know, again, history in this time was not written. It's history had been invented, and there were histories being written by this time, like we think of history, chronological, factually checked out, and everything else. But for the most part, that wasn't the dominant way of doing things in this part of the world. Okay? The Greeks did it that way, but Hebrews didn't, you know, the Romans uh, did histories, but didn't have the same kind of discipline about this. Because again, this was seen as a small illegal church, right? illegal in, in limited ways. But um, in terms of the fate of the apostles, this is the best we know. First, Judas Iscariot, of course, hanged himself uh, right after the crucifixion. James, the brother of John, was beheaded in Jerusalem in AD 44. He was the first of the apostles to die. And I put circuits on most of these because we don't have exact dates. Um, this is not James, the head of the Jerusalem Council. This is James, one of the sons of Zebedee. James and John, the sons of thunder. This is one of them. Then third, Philip, we believe, was hanged on a pillar in, in Herapolis in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, so around AD 54. Then James the Just, the head of the Jerusalem Council and half-brother of Jesus, thank you, um, was thrown to his death from the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 63. He was actually killed by the high priest. And because the high priest did this, the people rebelled against him and killed the high priest. This was a very rough time, AD 63. You will remember seven years later, this was all the time of turmoil. Seven years later, the Romans come in and destroy the whole city and destroy the temple. And so this kind of conflict, the conflict that led to James the Just being killed by the high priest and the high priest being murdered by the mob, was an example of just how unstable everything was that eventually led to the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. Okay? Then we believe that Peter was crucified in Rome during the persecution of Nero around AD 64. Um, tradition holds that Peter requested to be crucified upside down because he did not think himself worthy to be crucified in the same way as his Lord. And so they crucified him head down. Again, that's tradition. We don't know that for a fact. But we believe that was about AD 64. About three years later, AD 67, Paul was beheaded in Rome. The reason he was beheaded and not crucified is because Paul was a Roman citizen. And to be beheaded was appropriate for somebody who was a citizen of Rome. It's a quick death. It's not a slow, agonizing death like crucifixion. Um, again, still during the pers persecution of Nero. Now you'll notice they're both in Rome. The persecution of Nero was pretty much isolated to Rome and the environs. Uh, when Rome burned, Everybody blamed Nero. They thought he had set Rome on fire in order to rebuild it the way he wanted it, because he was a huge megalomaniac. Well, whether he did or not, we don't know for a fact. But all efforts to try to convince people he didn't weren't successful, and so Nero came up with a plan, or somebody did under Nero, to blame somebody else for it. And there were these group of uh, people, Christians, who didn't worship the Roman gods, who everybody thought there was something wrong with. The story was out there that they, you know, they ate the flesh of their founder. They were cannibals, all right? They have these love feasts where they do all manner of unspeakable things. <laughs> so all of these rumors happen. We're going to talk about that a little bit more next week. Um, and Nero blamed the Christians for having burned Rome. And so he had then permission to do whatever he wanted. Well, Peter and Paul, we believe, uh, ended up dying because of that persecution in and around Rome. Then Paul um, was beheaded in Rome. I, I just said that. Then Andrew, that's the next one I want to go to. Uh, Andrew was crucified, we believe, in Petrae in Achaia, which was part of Greek, what we know as Greece, in around AD 70. A number of the apostles died around the same time. Nathaniel, who, oops, sorry, who in one place is called uh, Bartholomew, if you look at the list of apostles, he's called Nathaniel or Bartholomew in different lists. Um, was flayed and then, um, that is, his skin peeled off and then crucified in Armenia around AD 70. Then Thomas, we believe, was run through with a lance. Tradition has it that he was killed in the East Indies, in the Dutch East Indies, the islands, you know, off of Asia. Um, because the tradition is that Thomas took the gospel to India. There was a church in India that attributes. Much of this is tradition. We don't know for a fact. I mean, 
one of the problems, and I'm not sure, I don't remember if it's your, our book or the one I was, the, the, the Gonzalez book, talks about the fact that it's very difficult to track the, the exact history because it became so popular to try to identify your church, wherever you were, as being uh, planted by an apostle, that they made up all kinds of stories, you know, that, that including, is that in, in, in our book? Did you read that? Uh, or is that in Gonzalez? Okay, I think it may have been in Gonzalez. Anyway, you get things like um, James, the brother of John, who was the first of the apostles to die, apparently went to Spain and evangelized Spain and did miracles in Spain, and then he came back just in time to have Herod Agrippa cut his head off. Okay? And then they took his bones back, and they're now at Santiago de Compostela. Santiago is uh, Spanish for St. James, and that, that is a site of miracle. At one time, that was the second most popular site of pilgrimage in the Christian world, in Christendom, after Rome, is Santiago de Compostela, which is the north western uh, area in Spain. And during the Reconquista, which is the time in which the, the Europeans fought back against the Moors, the Muslim Moors had taken all of North Africa, which you saw from the map a minute ago, at one time was all Christian. And they had come up through the Iberian Peninsula, had conquered Portugal, had conquered Spain, were all the way up into uh, France when Charles Martel uh, fought them off, fought them back into Spain, and then the Spanish got their act together and joined the, all their little kingdoms together and fought the Moors, drove them out of the Iberian Peninsula, which is Portugal and Spain. Well, when they drove them back out of Europe, uh, Western Europe, the cry was Santiago. They claimed miraculous presence, and there are all these stories about St. James actually appearing in order to lead the soldiers of Christian Europe against the Muslim Moors to drive them out of the Iberian Peninsula. Which That's, James was then? It's James the brother of, of John, okay. you know, not James the Just, okay? Um, and so there's no indication, he died quite early, there's no indication James ever went to Spain, historically, but that was the tradition, you know, that he went there before he died and then he came back in his bones later. Um, that became the tradition because it was very important to them, and in fact that became the battle cry that allowed them to free Christian Europe from Muslim occupation, so you can't fault them too much for that. But you also had Thomas going all the way to the East Indies, you know, the islands of the East Indies, you, you know, and, and all of India, just like Jesus was supposed to during, his, during the silent years between 12 and 30 was supposed to have gone to India. Um, you get all of these kinds of stories because at a certain point, in order to establish credibility, Various of these churches in various parts of the world would claim that they were founded by one of the apostles. And much of that isn't true. But that, those were the traditions. So the best we can tell, we think these traditions are correct. I didn't even put up the East Indies Islands on Thomas because that would seem so far-fetched to me, but, you know, whatever. Uh, then we have Matthias. Remember, Matthias was the one who was chosen to replace Judas Iscariot so that they would come back to 12. He was crucified and then stoned while he was hanging on the cross in Ethiopia in AD 70. During about the same period of time, Matthew is traditionally was beheaded in uh, uh, Nadavar in Ethiopia, sometimes 60 to 70. Thaddeus was shot through with arrows in Mesopotamia and killed. There are other traditions besides arrows, one that he was beheaded, but uh, we're not sure. In Mesopotamia, which would have been the land between the rivers, uh, Babylon, Assyria kind of place, in AD 72. Simon was the Simon the Zealot was crucified traditionally in Syria, which would have been part of Persia, um, further east than, than the Syria of Antioch, in AD 74. And then the only of one of the apostles that died of natural causes, as best we know, is John. John the Apostle, who was the youngest of the apostles, who became the elder of the churches in Asia Minor, who lived in Ephesus. And tradition holds, and we believe it's probably credible, that he took Mary, the mother of Jesus, there with him when he went to Ephesus. You can still go to Ephesus today and visit the traditional uh, home of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, and so he died of natural causes. There was, There is a tradition that they tried to boil John in oil, and it didn't kill him. That he was miraculously preserved, you know, got out of the pot, went, eh, not so much. <laughs> Causes as an old man. Okay. Bob? The first song. I've got a other little tidbits that I read somewhere. Okay. Absolutely positive they're, they're true. 
Um, James, who was thrown off the temple, supposedly didn't die from being thrown off the temple and so they stoned him to death. Or beat him with a club. Yeah. You know, beat him yeah. to death with a club. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> and then um, Andrew was supposedly crucified on an, uh, on an X-shaped cross. Right. He's now the patron saint of Scotland, and you probably noticed that the Scottish flag exactly. has an X-shaped cross. Exactly, he's the patron saint because that's the shape of the cross he was supposedly crucified on. And Thomas, I've seen the tugboat of Thomas in the cathedral of the Cross India and actually kissed it, so I think that probably makes me a saint by us. Okay. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> Well, I guess the Barney Stone, what does that do? Um, there are a lot of other supposed stories. These, what, what I've got up here is what I think is the most accepted. I say most accepted because there are other traditions. Again, as you say, some of them are extensions of this, like the fact that James the Just was thrown off the pinnacle of the temple and didn't die, and they either stoned him then or they beat him to death with a club. We don't know. Um, but it gives you an idea. This was the fate of the apostles. Um, now, this brings us to 100. The apostolic age ended when John died somewhere between 95 and 100. We then come to the time of the apostolic fathers, which are the immediate successors, those who had been trained by the apostles and took over leadership after them. Next week, we are going to pick up with the next period of time after. Now, the reason why, again, this is called Catholic Christianity is because by 100, the message of Jesus was available to everybody and had spread to uh, not only the Jewish faith, but to Gentiles of all kinds and colors and places. Uh, and so there was a Catholicism, a universality to the church at that point. Any questions? Very, very, very yes. Okay. Very, you know, I'm not. I'm not sure we really appreciate what these men, these apostles, did when Peter comes back from Cornelius's house. Uh, he, Cornelius goes into the group, and they don't greet him. They don't hug him. They don't tell him how great he is. They criticize him because he went to this Gentile house. Mm -hmm. And it would seem to me that the decisions that they came to in, in Acts 15 were all fleshed out, really hashed out by a bunch of men who were covered with this conflagration of confusion. I mean, this is just an, a real bad interruption of what we're used to. And, 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 and they wrestled through that. They struggled through that. They wanted to find the mind of God and find the Lord. And it says this. It says, after Peter told them what had happened, it says, when they heard this, I love this, when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, well, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Or in other words, well, I guess God's doing something new. Yeah. You might as well get used to it. But in fulfillment of His promises. Because <clears throat> He had always said, I will bless all nations. However, however, these are men who are, who are, who are born, raised, and, and, and bleed Jewish blood, Jewish law, Jewish customs, and traditions. So when you look at that, and you look at that context, and you see what they struggled with, it makes our issues that we deal with in the modern morality of today in society so small in comparison. Okay. Well, I, you know, along the lines of what he's saying, I grew up in a denomination that, I mean, if you, any type of miraculous work of God was viewed as, it would, it, you know, at least now in the present, was impossible, and if you believed in it, you were probably somewhat mentally unstable. And I had a professor at the Bible college that I went to, he said he was in Africa, and they were conducting a meeting, and a man came into that meeting that night, and became a, got saved and became a Christian, and they asked him, well, how did you find out about the meeting? He said, well, I walked three days to get here after I had a vision from God, telling me there were two men that were going to be preaching about the good news of you know how to be how to be saved, and he said, he said needless to say, he said I couldn't say there was you know no you're a liar because no that didn't happen. Yeah. He said and and, but, and so we in our day and age still in some ways wrestle with the workings of God that yeah. we don't understand or that we don't want to accept because they seem strange to us. Well, and people people have often asked me as we've studied like the Book of Acts in, in our church. 
Well, they had all these miraculous things, why, and that was the sign. Why don't we have miracles nowadays? And my answer is always, because you don't expect them. You don't really believe they can happen. You don't really believe they will happen, and so they don't. Well, they, they do happen in a, for people who are ready for it. But for most churches, they don't see miraculous events because our Western mindset has inoculated us against belief in the miraculous, even though that was the sign of the presence of God in the past. And I think that when individuals or when churches, when groups, reach the place of a spiritual maturity where they're ready for miracles, where they're ready to receive them and accept them and understand them as being something God is doing and not some hocus pocus, then God sends miracles. You know, and He does in other parts of the world that are ready for it. In fact, the reason why these guys went to these faiths, the reason why they testified against all pressure, against all of what had existed in the past, one reason. They had seen the risen Christ. There is Case that closed. miracle. There is no other explanation. Paul couldn't later go back to what he believed before because he said, I have, you know, I know he was dead, and I've seen him alive. And what am I supposed to do with that except believe? I can't not believe. The, mir the miracle, the thing that took this small band of scaredy cat Jews who were afraid of their own shadow, who were locked in a room hiding from the authorities, even after the ascension, the thing that made them into a force that changed the world, you know, that did what those maps show you happened in 70 years and 100 years and 200 years, was the realization that Jesus really was risen, and then the, the second, related to that, the miraculous presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Those two miracles, which they personally experienced in ways they could not deny, made them strong enough for this. Yeah, James' half-brother. What's that? James' half-brother. He didn't believe it, that Jesus was who he was until after he was resurrected. Well, James didn't believe it until after he was yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you all very much. We will see you next week. And I